Thank you, Pooja. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you and to the MAP Academy for inviting me to present um, the curatorial premise for the exhibition Out of Place Journeys Through Indian Art that's currently ongoing at the JNF Gallery at CSMS Museum, like Pooja just mentioned. <clears throat> So to just give you a brief outline, I'll start with an introduction and then we get into the uh, presentation. Could we actually have the uh, cover slide of um, presentation? Thank you. Um, so Out of Place Journeys Through Indian Art, it really sort of pulls together very diverse works from modern and contemporary Indian art to kind of investigate the experience of a place or places, uh, reflecting ideas of home and nation in relation to the world. So the underlying curatorial framework uh, for this exhibition considers moments of transit that is sort of going between two places or moving to or returning back to. So really at these in-between moments as thresholds to think about the shifting relationships with the sites that we inhabit. So think here not only of places that we live in, but also those that live in us, through us, the ones that we are sort of connected to through our ancestry, through language, through culture, through history. So uh, the title of the show was to connect with these plural meanings. And uh, so out of place, that is, could mean, you know, deriving out of the idea of place in transit, as well as being out of place, out of sync or displaced. Uh, the Hindi title in that sense, uh, which is Har Jagha Ajnabi, uh, which I find more poetic and intertextual in a way because uh, <clears throat> the way it lends itself to different meanings. Um, every place a stranger or every place is strange. Every place there are strangers. Every place one is a stranger too. Um, so uh, this was just to give you a little background uh, that the exhibition is not just a representation of places as it might seem from the title maybe. Uh, so it's not just a landscape exhibition or depicting different places, but it's really to sort of address the uh, uh, idea or the fashioning of identities and how we belong. Uh, you know, the way that we, uh, the one imagines an affiliation to a land or a culture by also looking at the representations of the body and the figure. So in that sense, the exhibition conflates the personal with the historical, personal journeys, it maps personal journeys onto uh, you know, larger collective movements and theoretical shifts. So the major challenge to uh, in curating this exhibition and planning how it would uh, you know, be set up was, um, <clears throat> how to present this multi-layered experience of place uh, that, you know, through linking these artworks across generations. So accordingly, I decided that, uh, you know, it, I took it up as a challenge to see if um, I could have different sections that would relate to these multiple um, sort of intertextualities, aspects that were coming out of just thinking about this idea, right? So uh, accordingly, there are about six sections in this show. Um, the idea of home, travel, exile, migration and migrancy, aesthetic lineages, trade and cultural exchange. I will get more into it and then you will uh, see how these things and you can see how they work and uh, converse with each other, the different works in the exhibition. <clears throat> Um, yeah, if I have a slight bad throat, if you can't hear me, just let me know at any point. So uh, this exhibition actually builds from the JNF collection along with uh, borrowed contemporary works. So while researching the JNF collection that covers almost uh, about 100 years, that is from early 1900s to the early 2000s, I began first by tracing the itinerance and art styles. 
uh, that evoke an engagement with myriad places and terrains, even within a single artist practice. So like you see here, so the exhibition explores the idea of travel and mobility and how visiting a place in actuality that is actually going to a place or even through just connecting to its culture, through to its art, has impacted image making. So further delving into the individual pieces, like uh, the specific pieces that were in our collection, is quite interesting because you, um, you know, new nuanced stories are then revealed about history, about how moments of history connect to uh, the ideas or the, uh, you know, the urgencies of the time that artists have tried to portray in their works. <clears throat> so it's also to, uh, you know, experience a site within its cultural, historical and social political context. What are the fissures in history that have uh, caused multiple displacements, how these have been represented in art. So um, this is the first section that we are going into. And I just want to say that actually the exhibition is not really laid out as a, a chronology of even sections. Uh, so you can kind of uh, go in anywhere and connect any section, you know, look at any section separately as well. But I'm beginning with this because I think it's a nice introduction into um, how we go forward. Uh, so this section is aesthetic lineages and it, basically um, is a section of the exhibition that focuses on experimentations by artists working in and around the time of Indian independence. That is artists who were either were born before and have witnessed independence have been directly impacted by it and were involved in this uh, sort of idea of a new nation, right? And uh, so just post independence, there was a new mobility that came with independence and that saw many artists relocate, uh, travel to different cities across the world, also traverse uh, historical and cultural sites within India to devise unique and varied art styles. So many artists at that point were, uh, you know, searching for an aesthetic language that would represent these ideas of uh, progress and the art identity of a new nation. So here we see, I think, what characterizes this time uh, as uh, we were looking through the collection and looking at artists, uh, the same artists, but like uh, artworks from different periods in the same artist's life. Uh, we see this, you know, extreme kind of uh, fluctuation and living in different places in, in that sense, even in, in the way that the works evoke. So if you look at this first slide, uh, on the right, we have Jamini Roy, which is a very signature work of Jamini Roy, you know, where he incorporates uh, the traditional Kali Ghat painting of Bengal and sort of contemporizes it in using, making his own sort of figures and forms. And that is the sort of uh, work that he was uh, really, was a signature work that one knows Jamini Roy by, right? At the same time, on the left, you see this rather unusual work of um, Jamni Roy, but there are many works that he did like this. Now, this uh, work on the left was from 1925. And uh, what I mean about place is, if you look at that work, it really looks like it could be a landscape uh, in Europe somewhere, right? And it is heavily sort of taking from post-impressionist art. And so you see this kind of thing, this moving between and oscillations between the local, global, you know, should we be uh, retaining our, some of our tradition? Should we be looking at global trends, Western modernism? So the East and the West, tradition, indigeneity, modernity. So all of these are detected through different periods in a single artist's life. Um, <clears throat> uh, so we can go to the next slide. Here again, you see uh, Bendre. Both works are by Bendre again. And the right is works by Bendre that is sort of more recognizable. And on the left, you see this work, which uh, is very much, you know, it, it's actually work that he made. He visited China and was very influenced by the art of China. And so you see that sort of washed uh, landscape 
uh, you know, Chinese landscape, which is also interestingly reminiscent of some of the Bengal school landscape painting like Binod Bihari Mukherjee, right? Moving on to the next. Um, yeah. So these are unusual. This is another very unusual work by Gai Tonde. Uh, again, a very well-known name in modern art. Uh, and here we see how Gaitonde's experiments with European post-war art, right? Influenced by um, painters like Paul Klee. And if you go to the next slide, uh, on the left is also a Gaitonde because he was also very uh, sort of taken in and really, um, you know, with Zen Buddhism, the ideology of Zen Buddhism, and this Chinese sort of calligraphy, Chinese and Japanese cal cal calligraphic work in painting. And interestingly, I have juxtaposed this even in the exhibition, there are these sort of connections that you see between very disparate artists that you may not put together otherwise, you know. So on the right, you have K.G. Subramaniam. And here again, you see, even though uh, ideologically and art historically, and in every way, they were quite like on opposite sides, you know. Uh, but at the same time, here we see how delving into this sort of Zen Buddhism, or the art of China and Japan of the Far East, you see these kind of synergies even within very disparate artists. So uh, moving on to the next slide. <clears throat> and of course, K.G. Subramaniam was a sort of master of experimentation and literally in a way, no two works look the same, right? If, with the selection that we have in the exhibition. So here you see how he uh, is also integrating traditional craft, folk art, European modernism, and Eastern painting styles. So the, the work on the right is actually reverse painting on glass. And uh, if, uh, I mean, if the, uh, what is the artist that you would think of when you look at that work is probably someone like Picasso with those, uh, you know, different forms and different uh, like perspectives of the same form, which are put into one work. So it looks like a mishmash of a portrait. But so it's taking from that, but it's also making it very contemporary and very local, right? So uh, the next uh, slide. So here, these are two sculptures. So this exhibition actually brings together not only paintings, there also sculptures, prints, there's film, there's uh, different sort of mediums of art that you'll see. Here, this is uh, on the left is uh, uh, Mira Mukherjee, and on the right is Pradosh Das Gupta. So the reason I've just put these two together is to also just think about uh, the three-dimensional or sculptural form. And the bronze sculptures by uh, both of these artists show the diverse manifestations of the figure. Uh, so in Meera Mukherjee's uh, work, it's interesting because she went to Bastar and learned the technique of Dogra casting, which is a brass uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, working with brass. And uh, so that it's kind of technique where you make a mold out of mud and it's a lost wax process. First you make a sculpture out of wax and then you uh, make a mold and you pour in the metal so it get, the wax moves out and uh, gets replaced with the metal. So it's a very, um, I mean, the reason I'm getting so technical is because it's a very specific technique to Bastar. And you will see those coil forms. You may have seen those in craft exhibitions and places. Almost every home has one of these, you know, um, uh, forms from Bastar. But then she uses that technique and sort of uh, makes it her own, or you mix different forms which are more her own, right? And uh, on the right, you see Pradosh Das Gupta, and a lot of early sculpture uh, was very, very influenced by Henry Moore and Rodin. Uh, it's actually a very beautiful form if you come to the gallery. Uh, it's, uh, of course, sculptures it doesn't do justice to look at in images, but the way the, the fluidity of the form and still so robust is something that you see in these works. Uh, moving on, <clears throat> this of course is uh, Swaminathan, 
Ji Swaminathan. And uh, interestingly, uh, you know, again, that there are quotes that I have included by each artist, just to tell you the sort of, uh, you know, the ideas and the melding of different ideas and thoughts that characterize that time. So uh, the idea of progress was something uh, that was you know, really discussed in, in the, uh, while talking about um, modernity and modernism in India as well. And so these ideas of progress were very strong in the early decades post-independence. And in Swaminathan's work, and also in some of the others, we see this alternate reading of the idea of progress, right? Which is more through a folk kind of understanding, a folk ideology. And uh, <clears throat> so he sort of, the linear perspectives of Western modernism are countered through the fluidity and the pattern that is inspired from folk and, tri the folk and tribal imagination in Swaminathan's work. And in fact, in the 80s, Swaminathan created the Tribal Museum and Bharat Bhavan Bhopal. So he was a real proponent of tribal art and you know, looking at forms and color and the sort of simplicity and the narrative within these forms. But if you look at this work more closely, so you'll see how the colors are all inspired by actually Pahadi miniatures, you know, primary colors of Pahadi miniatures. And if you go really close, I don't know if you can see it in the, um, it's a big work, but I'm not sure if you can see it in the presentation. There's one tiny little, uh, you know, like a grasshopper form. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, that. So it completely changes the scale from something that looks quite abstract to something then becomes like an exploded, uh, you know, magnified landscape. So this section was, is just, uh, we can move on to the next. There are many, many artists, of course, that you can think of and include like that. Uh, this is, of course, uh, Ram Kumar. This was also became the poster for our uh, poster work for our show. Um, <clears throat> so interestingly, uh, you know, we have many works by Ram Kumar uh, in Indian art and many works that he has done of Banaras. So he was extremely sort of taken in by Banaras. And interestingly, a lot of artists from that period have painted Banaras and Kashmir. So it just got me thinking because as a, as a new country, I think it's interesting to also look at it in terms of a, the draw that these places held, not only as they are definitely transformative places if you go and visit there, but also, and very unique landscapes, but also they were historically loaded and show how, you know, some of these sites gain cultural currency as places that one would associate with India for tourism, for, you know, to visit and all of that. So it's interesting that this, these were the sort of works that it's a, it's a, I mean, of course I couldn't include everything, but this is just to sort of have these kind of conversations and generate these kind of conversations through this section. <clears throat> uh, moving on, yeah. So this is uh, uh, Gade. This is Kashmir. Uh, this is Kashmir. Now again, you see how it's been painted. It looks, uh, you know, it could look like again a European landscape with this very expressionistic uh, way of painting here. And uh, you can see that Shikara there and could easily look like a you know place in Switzerland or something. But uh, yeah, so that kind of, uh, you know, melding of styles, melding of, of uh, artistic thoughts and places and how to represent them. Uh, moving on, uh, there is, uh, yeah, so these are again two works by very interesting works by Bakri. Uh, the one on the left is called Skyscraper New York, and the one on the right is Alcatraz. So, like I was talking about the sort of new mobility, people looking at new landscapes, places, and also not only that, but how language is developing in different parts of the country and how it's melding so many different forms. A lot of times, a lot of these artists may not have actually visited, not these, of course, he visited, but I'm saying a lot of uh, the way that uh, post-impressionist uh, forms come in 
or the styles of painting may not necessarily mean that one has gone there and studied it, but these were the images that were being circulated and, uh, you know, one sort of incorporated that in their work. Uh, moving on. <clears throat> Um, so in the uh, mesoson of the exhibition, when you enter right next to the door, you have this uh, huge, very large drawing by Gulam Sheikh, um, the, the the brown and the, uh, the the drawing on the left side, and basically it is corner of a railway station. And I thought it was interesting to include this as one of the first works that one encounters because just thinking about that idea uh, of place, of the in-between place. And uh, of course, it's a railway station. If you actually visit the exhibition or see the work in, in person, um, it's interesting because it just unfolds so many different forms when you look at it. The more you look at it, the more you know you kind of start seeing there is a chai wala, there's a railway track, there's, you know, the sort of hustle bustle that one sees at a railway station. And the reason to include this as one of the first works was because, you know, railway stations also transport terminals and transport terminals uh, may be imagined as portals to another place, right? So, um, so yeah, so that's what you see in this. And right next to this work is a really small, very like a jewel-like work uh, and it looks seemingly very abstract right not something that one may even recognize as a gulam sheikh work because as you know the baroda school is usually characterized by or known through its narrative storytelling sort of way but actually if you read the title of this work it's called ladakh so it is a portrayal of the landscape of Ladakh. And if some of you have been to Ladakh, you'd know that it is a magical landscape and it's not exactly these bright colors, but yeah, the mountains are, you know, with the mineral contents, they, they do have tinges of pinks and yellows and greens. So uh, quite incredulous how that uh, magical sort of landscape is read into how it's also been painted through these sort of bizarrely, uh, <clears throat> you know, jewel colors. Uh, moving on to the next. Uh, so here I've just um, put two, again, two different artists. One on the right is Tayyab Mehta, of course. And on the left is an artist called Ganesh Haloi. Um, Ganesh Haloi is now 88 years old. And we had a large exhibition of his works just last year. It was one of his first like big retrospective exhibition. He's still alive. And uh, the, interestingly, both these artists were, uh, you know, were directly kind of impacted by uh, partition, by things that they witnessed during partition. In the case of Ganesh Haloi, he lived in Bangladesh. And the second partition, the Bangladesh War in 1971, uh, caused his family and him to sort of move from Bangladesh to Calcutta. And his work, though seemingly very abstract, is uh, really about the terrain. And in, a, in many of his works, you could imagine the work, I'm talking about the work on the left, you could imagine uh, this as an aerial view, you know, topographical view of the land. And, uh, <clears throat> and interestingly, Tayyab Mehta has spoken about this himself, that during partition in, in, while he was in Bombay, he actually saw someone being killed on the street and that had a huge sort of impact on him. Uh, and that's something that haunted him. And that's why a lot of his works, the, the work on the right by Tayyab Mehta is something that is also something very recognizable as the Yamata's works. Uh, you know, you see how forms are sort of sliced off. They're not complete, they're sliced off. There's also this big diagonal that's slicing the canvas literally into half, you know, on a diagonal. So, I, and I think there are more and more readings now that we are uh, remo like to, removed in time from partition. I feel it's easier for people to also speak about about these kind of things that happened uh, through the distance in time. 
And I, a lot of people are now reading these as, you know, uh, even looking at the severance of the land, not only just the violence in terms of what happened with people, but also this kind of slicing of the land. So I put these works together because I think even in Haloe's work, it's interesting that there are these two claims that then join, you know. So these broken, severed, uh, split planes in both these works uh, reminisce the brutal severance of the partitions, which caused, I think, one of the largest human displacements and continue to cause border tensions today, right? <clears throat> Can move to the next. This is just to show you the uh, how these were displayed. And again, uh, the thing in this exhibition is that I've sort of uh, not uh, kept to the categories that art history uh, sort of puts down of abstraction and narration and this and that and all of that. It's mainly to really find synergies in thought, synergies in time, synergies in representation and not really looking at, uh, you know, linear sort of progression of styles. So again, it's interesting because I think for me, uh, Gulam Sheikh's this small Ladakh and even the other one with Haloi, these are again artists you wouldn't really see together because their works are very, very different uh, otherwise, you know, but I feel like here in the portrayal of this landscape, uh, they do sort of have some synergies in how they portray the land as aerial views, you know. Um, so moving forward. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> so uh, this is the work, uh, this is a work by Taya Mehta called Falling Figure. This is what I was speaking about just earlier, how he was so impacted by actually witnessing someone being killed on the streets during the partition in 1947. And uh, so I think the way that he constructs the body as um, a site of violence and trauma, where it's kind of stripped of all identity, right? It's mutilated, it's a mutilated form. Um, and I think this is one of the first of this series of works, which was referenced from his memory. And I find it very interesting because if you look at the earlier work, uh, that uh, the, the red work that we had just seen, the colors and everything are very, very different in this, right? Of what we know of the Yermeta. But it is a really fabulous work of this figure just falling into this abyss. There are these light, light pastel tones, which is very different from what how stark they become later. And interestingly, it's also a very large canvas. When you go close to it, you see it's uh, it's almost uh, you know Bacon esque in in its treatment, like Francis Bacon where it looks like just paint daubs and marks and the figure is kind of turned upside down. So uh, it was so one, um, one aspect of this exhibition for me was also to study, you know, how, how does an artist, how would an artist paint that level of disenfranchisement, like, you know, someone who's been stripped of their identity, literally violated. So there is this figure which has been completely turned upside down and is falling into this abyss, right? And how this affects real lives, the violence affects real lives. So these are again connections that I'm showing you that we made in the exhibition. So there is uh, the Taya Mehta work before that. And this is a work by Arpana Kaur. Uh, if you can just go back to the previous slide and now just you see how, uh, you know, you see these kind of synergies. Now again, Arpana Kaur's work is, uh, is sort of representing, the, is a reference to the riots against the Sikhs in 1984, right? And I feel like the way it's drawn, it does also have a bit of a caricature sort of element to it, but in that sense of of you know losing ground kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> so imaging these displaced, so this whole section sort of continues and imaging these displaced figures in crisis, it continues through 
the works of uh, Chittapasad and also Somnath Kaur, right? And uh, so uh, these both these artists made, uh, you know, showed the devastation that was caused during the Bengal famine of 1943, uh, which is believed to have wrecked over 3 million lives across undivided India. And the famine uh, was, was believed to be a direct outcome of British mismanagement during the Second World War. And artists like Bhattacharya and Somnath Hor represented in their works this sort of extent of this devastation. And here you see the figures again, uh, as I mentioned right in the beginning in my introduction, the exhibition is also sort of, uh, you know, studying uh, the representation of the body as a subject of place. And, you know, so here you see the figure is again, like in Tayyab's work, is again a faceless, nameless sort of entity uh, as a site on which trauma and disaster is then inflicted, embodying these grave this grave historical event in the nation's history. <clears throat> uh, moving on to the next section, this section is called Exile. And in this section, actually, I've, I've, uh, it, it moves to a different sort of register. Uh, which deals more with biographical, uh, you know, um, biographical works. So to do with individual lives in which uh, experiences of exile take on kind of different understandings, but they are all sort of put in conversation with each other. So this work is, of course, Zarina Hashmi. Uh, many of you may know Zarina Hashmi. She passed away, I think, just uh, last last year. And <clears throat> her works became uh, metaphors for the complex association of home as a place of refuge and, and exile. So uh, basically, Zarina as an artist, she's consistently explored the idea of being and belonging in multiple times and places relating to her own itinerant life. So she's lived in many different places. Of course, she also has the partition histories in her family's ancestry, which most of us in India have. But also uh, she lived in places around the world because I think she was married to a diplomat and she moved around. So she was born in Aligarh, she moved to Delhi, Bangkok, Mumbai. She lived in Paris, Tokyo, Los Angeles, Bonn, New York, London. So, uh, so again, I've included this quote, which you could uh, read of uh, Zarina, but basically she's saying how, you know, she's lived in places all over the world. And uh, though she doesn't feel at home anywhere in the world, the idea of home follows her everywhere. And here in these works actually also are unusual works as in lesser seen works by Zarina because this is from an earlier time from the 70s. This is a time when Zarina was in Delhi and it's quite interesting how these works have been made because she's actually used blocks of wood which she has then put ink on and then pressed them down to make these works. Now what are these works right? So usually uh, she her works uh, reference maps borders, architectural blueprints, daily objects. And here you see these architectural forms in a way, which become symbolic. So this work that's on the screen right now is titled Cage. And again, it's, it's kind of looking at that dual belonging and the dual kind of feeling of home, which simultaneously becomes a place of security as well as of confinement you know, refuge as well as of exile. The same thing with the previous work is a boarded up fence, you know, so that also has that same kind of uh, feeling. <clears throat> we can move on to the next work in this section. Uh, this is again, another very beautiful drawing by Arpana Kaur called Sanyasi. And um, for me, it was interesting to put this also in the section of exile because, you know, how one thinks of a, Hermit is the one who has uh, left the comforts of home, right? And maybe this is the home, but 
Uh, but I feel like if you if you think about a hermit uh, and how to represent a hermit, uh, what is the terrain that you would do, right? So you see at the in the background you see uh, these mountain ranges sketched, right? Mountain peaks in the background, which uh, and I've read something that Arpana herself has written about these works, and she calls it a timeless space. So the mountains as the mountainous terrain representing this timeless space for the hermit, one who's left the comforts of home. And of course, there are arrows at the bottom, which, so there's penance, med meditation, and isolation, which are then linked to the terrain in the work as a hermit. Uh, go moving on to the next. So this is, uh, again, a very large work that we have by M.F. Hussain. <clears throat> M. F. Hussain really needs no introduction because I think everybody knows M. F. Hussain. He's the one artist that became a street name. He became a public figure. Uh, whether people know art or not, everybody would know of M. F. Hussain. And what is the reason for that, right? So, and and what is the reason of for me to include this work? So, if you notice, this work is called autobiography. <clears throat> And uh, this is sort of a more oblique reference because I've included the work in reference to uh, Hussein's own life, right? The trajectory of his own life. So Hussein was something straight after independence. He was actually a very populist artist. Uh, it's not about whether people like his work or not. A lot, a lot of us artists had serious problems with his work and because he was so populist. The kind of things that he would represent was very sort of, uh, you know, extreme Brahmanical images of uh, Mahabharata, Ramayana, uh, populist icons such as Mother Teresa later on. Uh, even from film like Madhuri Dikshet and all of that, you know that. So he also fashioned, so he was a people's person. He also sort of fashioned himself as this artist, you know, not wearing slippers and, and really sort of living that persona, right? And the reason that he became so well known was also because the state, he became uh, the artist who was, uh, promoted by the state, who was adopted by the state as India's artist, because he was uh, representing this kind of imagery, the populist imagery that won. So again, this reads back into what we were talking about, the artists around independence and the reading of what India should be, what should one associate as the culture of uh, India, right? And here we see the ex extreme, almost uh, right-wing kind of uh, imagery in a way you can uh, you can say. <clears throat> so the uh, interesting thing about um, why this is part of the show is also in reference to his own life. I'll tell you a little bit about him. He was uh, born in 1913 in Pandharpur, Maharashtra. He died in London at the age of 95. Uh, that's because he also was uh, sort of pressurized into self-exile by the end of his life. And the reason is that um, <clears throat> basically there was a time, so uh, there was a time when in the 90s, uh, you know, the, uh, the Babri Masjid was demolished, there was this rise of the right wing in Hindutva, all of that. And slowly, slowly, the perception of the artist's work changed. Suddenly the questions were about his own religious identity, like how can a Muslim artist be representing uh, Hindu gods and goddesses? There was also that very um, controversial work, became controversial work of Mother, uh, of Mother India. And basically because he had portrayed these uh, figures as nude. Now before that, this was never a problem, right? So, uh, the way that I am reading into it is, it's not about his work, but it speaks more about the changing perspectives um, of our society, right? And ironically, I think the ultimate irony is that he was a state artist promoted, 
he got the padma bhushan padma vibhushan he was in the run for the bharat ratna all of that and suddenly you know what hit him there were factions of fundamentalists who would uh, for a long time even we couldn't show his works right i wasn't there jnf but there was a long time that nobody could show mf hussain's works cuz they were under threat of uh, violence right and so uh, it's just interesting that in this ultimate irony that someone who has been promoted and is the artist of india and known as that uh, is then uh, really kind of forced into self exile so there were threats to his life and finally he lived out his life in qatar <clears throat> and uh, so i think through his work we link these shifting ideas of india and indianness in modern society we also trace the role of religion politics and morality and um, you know how these are intertwined <clears throat> the next the, this is the last work in this section exile and of course it's green <laughs> exile on top but it's interesting because this is uh, one of jitish kalat um uh, it is it still acts one of his earliest works uh, from 98 when he was a very recent graduate from the jj school of art so in a way i'm looking at it as a portrait of a young artist because he did this with uh the self image where he uh, he would use different labels existential labels alongside this silhouette of an image to kind of uh, contemplate the ideas of the self right so uh, it and the way this the if you look at the uh, if you actually go in front of the work you see that the texture of this is very much like a uh, he's worked on the canvas surface that it doesn't look plain but it's extremely textured like a rough concrete wall right and so uh, the canvas is actually masquerading as a wall and the painting masquerades as graffiti so it's it's meant to look like it is graffiti on the street um so yeah so th these are the different ideas of like you know these are more biographical works that uh, then and personal trajectories that are in conversation in thinking about exile uh i'll move to the next section which is home <clears throat> um again this this uh section is a, is a little bit more of a metaphor uh because in this section i was trying to uh, look at the idea of dual belongings like how one is when one is home you know home is a place of love uh, comfort security also personal belief and ritual and these these ways of being at home sometimes can also not be in sync or jostle with social cultural and religious norms so that kind of dual belonging of belonging at home and also belonging in society and in that sense there are these works that we put together this first work is by atul dodia also very interesting work cuz it's Uh, earlier work <clears throat> and in this work basically atul um this is a time when atul was in a residency abroad in europe and he was thinking back about bombay and home so that's a portrait of anju dodia uh, his wife who is also a very well known artist and this is in her home studio she is looking out so i thought it was interesting this idea of in being inside and looking out so through this architectural device of a window and the figure sort of turned looking out now interestingly what atul says about this work is that the landscape that you see outside is fictitious because what he's done is he has replaced the chawls that they saw outside their house to the Uh, netherlandish or the landscapes of europe that where he was <laughs> so it was this sort of melding uh, you know of worlds in a way and then we move on to the next so these are again very intimate works by uh, um arpita singh 
and very, very delicate, small format drawings and watercolors. Here again on the left side, you see this figure, you see these kind of, uh, you know, this defining of spaces and also weaving together of spaces. So I think it's interesting the different kind of uh, stylistic forms and aspects that she brings in because to me, it looks a lot also like textile, you know, patchwork and stitching. Uh, interestingly, a journalist had um, asked me uh, that, you know, this exhibition is about place, but there are also a lot of dead bodies in it. And uh, this work on the left, I mean, one could also read as a dead body or just as a sleeping figure. But I think that's what's really interesting in Arpita's works. You know, you can look at them and there is uh, this amazing tension of in both. And I was just joking with her that, you know, yeah, it's true, like all the women look active and, you know, busy. And the men in, the, in, the, in these works look like either they're sleeping or they're dead, <laughs> you know. And uh, so, but there's this amazing sort of tension in these works where there's this plane flying over, you know, the figures do look like also severed, but also in very deep, like comfortable kind of ease. And that also speaks about the body and the representation of the male, the female form, you know, the body language as well. So those were the sort of things that I thought were interesting. Again, these are two other works that are also featured in the exhibition. We can move to the next. <clears throat> uh, this is also uh, in the same section. This is a very famous work by uh, Francis Newton Souza called Death of a Pope. And uh, it's interesting because, um, I mean, A, uh, Souza is someone who was very, very articulate. So I have uh, put this quote, which I thought was amazing in what uh, and, and how he thinks. And uh, basically there is also another quote where he says that, you know, um, the Renaissance painters, they, they made uh, men and women, they painted them to look like angels and gods. And I am painting for gods and angels to show them what men and women are really like. So you see these sort of demonic forms and a lot of it arose from actually the trajectory of his own life. Uh, he was brought up to be a Catholic priest. Uh, and, and of course he became, he had huge issues with the orthodoxy in, the, in religion. And that's what he was really portraying. In this work, Death of a Pope was also uh, you know, there was another show that we had done of F.L. Souza in 2021, which was curated by Ranjit Hoskote. And during the research of this exhibition, and Ranjit had also written about it, we found that uh, the, this uh, death of a Pope was not him just trying to be rebellious and, you know, paint these things. But there was an actual photo which looked exactly like this. And, uh, uh, you know, where there are these ministers around, priests uh, around uh, this figure of the Pope. And it was an actual moment in time. And this Pope uh, was known to have, was believed to have Nazi connections and a support of the Nazi regime. So there was some logic to that. The way that this uh, work is included in this show is again of this kind of dual belongings that I was telling you that, you know, one, you, uh, one is in something but also with without like outside of it so that kind of moving in and out and sometimes I think works like this also make you think about how many of our practices are maybe not updated enough to incorporate uh, you know contemporary life so if you read that quote on uh, which is really brilliant it basically is ridiculing again all the priests and the ministers and he's talking about himself as someone who is in the city on the second floor of his apartment smoking a cigarette and looking down at these busy clergymen going about their business and he says that you know what do they know 
of the suffering of a city dweller because they only know the the suffer, the simple suffering of the one in thorns uh, you know the crown of thorns so i think it's it's interesting how he sort of works with this uh, uh, these ideas we can move forward to the next work yeah <clears throat> This is a work by Bhupen Kakkar. So these works are also in conversation in the show. This work is called uh, Around the Temple by Bhupen Kakkar. And the one thing that's that's really fascinating, I think, about Bhupen Kakkar is that he's very, uh, in his work, there was an honesty. He would portray things the way that they are, right? So this work is called Around the Temple. If you think about any artist wanting to portray any architectural places, monuments, or temples. It would usually be, uh, you know, a sanitized version of it. You would not see some of the things that you actually see there in the work. So you would filter out and maybe make a architectural structure of the temple, the nice tree and avenue and all that. But here, this is what is actually uh, any temple in India, right? There's a whole other market. There is a whole market around it. There's a whole community that thrives of the economy of the temple as well. As well as there's just humanity right there. There, there. So you see this, like, you know, figure pooping. There's all kinds of things happening right there. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so works by... Both Souza and Bhupen. So you can see how this was also displayed. So maybe seeing as going against this sort of political correctness and also implying the inadequacy of very rigid ideas of religion, civility, morality uh, to really encompass lived current realities. Uh, we can go to the next. Uh, these are more works by Bhupen that we have in the same section. Now, uh, uh, as you may know, uh, Bhupin Kakkar was one of the first openly uh, gay artists in the sense that he actually portrayed his life with great honesty in his work. And I think it, it, it was really an act of courage because uh, Bhupin lived in a time that uh, you know, um, these queer identities were outlawed in his lifetime. So in a way, it, it, it wasn't legal, like he wasn't even recognized, you know, that, so, that, that kind of reality that he portrays in his life, but with great wit and great humor. So the work on the left is called Two Men, and this work on the right is called uh, they loved each other so much that they wore the suit of the same design. And this is an etching, actually. And again, you see these two forms that have kind of melded together. But he's just portraying his life and love and, you know, home and intimacy. And uh, if you go forward, uh, this again <clears throat> is fantastic work. So he was very witty, very tongue-in-cheek with his titles as well. Uh, this work is called He Wears His Gandhi Topi, or He Wears His Gandhi Cap. And the image, the painting, it's a watercolor of a man with his pajamas off. So, you know, one is, one is patriotic, one is nationalist, one is Gandhian, you know, even though there are these kind of uh, not recognized by the law, you know, an outlaw in a way. So I think it's it's a, in a very humorous way. It's at the same time very pointed and very political works. It could be read like that as well. Um, <clears throat> moving on to the next. So this is just, again, I've interspersed it with uh, a few slides from how we displayed. And so the on the right, you see that work by Atul. And on the left, you have this work by Sudhir Patwardhan. And uh, yeah, one sec. Yeah. But how am I doing on time? I'm a little late. Okay, wrap it up quickly. Um, so basically, these uh, the reason that this was displayed like that is because we have these two walls that uh, you know form again a threshold space for me. Like territorially, that was how it was decided to put these together. 
and also Atul was very influenced by Sudhir Patwardhan as well, you can see in the works. Also, there was this interesting thing of uh, that Atul's figure like looking out and this one looking in, so that idea of inside, outside. <clears throat> we can move on to the next. Uh, yeah, so this uh, so this moves on into a section called migrancy, and basically the section sets up a consideration of uh, the nomadic existence of India's migrant labor and many people who sort of move for work and up and down, but mainly the labor histories which are continually displaced. Um, <clears throat> so in Sudhir Patwardhan's painting, I think is a, is a work that uh, I, I really find uh, is very, very impactful. Again, with the title of the work, it's called Bhaiya. Now, Bhaiya usually means older brother or, you know, in, in Hindi and is used to call out to strangers. But I think in, in Bombay, it has a very, very specific uh, relation to an identity, a regional identity. So Bhaiya in Bombay means people from UP and, and Bihar. And it's used in a sort of ethnocentric way, you know, people from outside. So I thought it was very interesting for him to portray this figure of the migrant uh, give it now there is no space for the migrant in the city really the laborer uh, and so you see this makeshift home just where you know set the city is separated with the with just this sort of cloth and uh, he catches him in like an intimate moment and just the way that the figure has been portrayed with this sense of dignity you know uh, not a nameless faceless laboring body is also something very almost Renaissance like, you know, like Netherlandish painting, like which Sudhir himself also says. But uh, <clears throat> but it's interesting to think of uh, this also duality also, that Bhaiya evokes the paradox between the city's pride in its cosmopolitanism, which Bombay does have, and, but also on the other hand, this uh, it's ethnocentric biases and xenophobia. So it's a reminder of the fault lines, um, fault lines of marginalizations along caste, class, caste, you can think of, you know, all those kind of things that it could extend to. Um, this is a work by Heber. Again, like I said, there's different works that are in conversation with each other. Much earlier work, again, Riksha Puller. We can go to the next. Uh, this this very fascinating work on the left by Shibu Natesan. And again, on the right is Sudhir Patwardhan. The reason we put these two works together is also to show you the different terrains and organize this, this unorganized labor sector. So here we have this image of rice plantation harvest that is taking place. And you see this row of laborers, right? Row, row of field workers, almost like machines. And there is uh, this figure, this dark shadowy figure of the Zamindar probably, you know, so that whole power sort of thing. And also interestingly, none of these uh, migrants or laborers who actually work to make the cities or grow food or agriculture really partake in any uh, of uh, the fruits of their labor in a way, right? And so right, the one on the right was called Dying City by Sudhir Patwardhan. So just showing you this sort of urban and um, again, like a more rural uh, agricultural terrains. Uh, you can move to the next. Yeah. <clears throat> so in the 70s, uh, we see Krishan Khanna's uh, preoccupation with the subaltern figure in the context of urban life. And this is a work that is called uh, Rare View. And here we see a very, diff it's a very different work of uh, Krishan Khanna's, if you've seen Krishan Khanna's works, which are a lot more figurative, a, a lot more colorful. But here the forms have been sort of abstracted. And again, here we see an abstraction of the body of labor. Now you may ask where the labor is, but 
in this work, so this is part of a larger series, or rather, Krishna Khanna did many other works that were also called Rare View. And basically, those works were showcasing this extreme period of industrialization, construction in the 70s in Delhi, urbanization that was happening. And even now, you see this side of uh, the back of trucks, which are packed in with uh, cargo, with uh, you know construction material, with cattle, with all kinds of things, the construction material and the laborers together. So he found that you know it looked like they were all even the laborers looked like dehumanized cargo themselves and mixed in with their with their saman with their stuff. So if you really look at this work carefully, you know, again, you, this is um, a work you need to stand um, in front of because it's big. You actually start seeing the forms emerge. So you see big hands and feet and faces and things. And you can also imagine these boulders and, you know, those girders and things like a pack back of a truck. <clears throat> we can go to the next. So uh, this is an artist called Pilu Pochkanwala, who's also Bombay based. And she is a very, very interesting artist because she used, uh, she was I think one of the first women sculptors to be using all these very unusual and usually uh, material associated more with like labor and you know, more with like male artists. And interestingly, the, uh, the earlier work, Rare View, was also from the 70s. This is also 70s by Pilu. And there's a shift that happens in Pilu's works where you look at the material that she's used in this work is steel alloys and again, construction material. So these are the sort of conversations we were trying to make within works. The works also, if you go to the next slide, you will see how uh, we displayed it. So we displayed it right next to each other, the sort of haphazard things, forms, urban forms, construction that kind of has echoes with both Krishnakarna and Bilu's works. We can go to the next. Uh, this I won't get a lot into so that we also have some time to discuss. But this is again part of the same uh, section called Migrancy. And this work is by Altaf, very beautiful one feet by one feet series of works that almost look like a, you know, like a panel comic caricature, comic strip sort of unfolding. You see that movement through these things. And they're just simply called worker A, B, C, D, right? And again, representation of the labor, the laboring body. Again, you see that these are just the body that, laboring body that moves, works, you know, limbs and the actions that become apparent. And I won't get into the history of Altaf, so we you can read about that later. Um, <clears throat> so this was, uh, right next to this was so curatorially also, I'm also giving you a background between how we connected works. So this work, uh, Altaf's was put right next to a work, a video work by Suresh Bibi. And interestingly, this video by Suresh PV is very sort of made in the early 2000s. He taught himself all this, like he, he wasn't proficient, he didn't study video art or film. And uh, I think the way of making this is also very interesting, the way that the images are patched in and juxtaposed on top of each other. And basically, this is called the Golden Quadrilateral Project. It was... Uh, an homage to road workers in the Golden Quadrilateral Project, which was basically this huge grand project, a national project that connected the national highway project that connected the four corners of India, different cities. So, uh, I mean, it's happened and it, it is connected, but there was a lot of corruption that happened. Many laborers died. There was a whistleblower who was the contractor, the <clears throat> civil engineer, Satyendra Dubey, who uh, did try to, uh, you know, uh, alert people about this, but then he was mysteriously killed. So just thinking about all that, the idea of speed and, uh, you know, development and all that, and the other cost involved in it, people building it, this kind of migrant labor that doesn't really have any like doesn't have any uh, you know space they're constantly nomadic constantly displaced 
constantly, uh, you know, there's great apathy in how we uh, deal uh, with people. So moving on to the next, uh, this is a video, but I think let's not get into it tomorrow. Like I played for it. <laughs> okay, yeah. So it's a video just shows that action of, uh, you know, uh, this road worker constantly doing that and the background keeps changing uh, with windmills and snails and things like that. <clears throat> now that this is the last of in this uh, section in migrancy, where this is a work as recent as this is from la not last year, last to last year now since we're 2024. This is from 2022 by Nilima Sheikh called Return. It's uh, basically her response and uh, her representation of uh, the major migrant crisis that happened during COVID, where the government kind of um, stopped, completely stopped public transport. Uh, and nobody really realized that how many lakhs and lakhs of people were stranded and walked miles to their states across country. Many of them again died on the way, carrying their old cane, carrying everything that they want because that I mean they literally walked. And again, there are no numbers released and things. So this was her sort of portrayal of that. You see these figures on the move, you see how they're just carrying everything. And it's interesting that Nilima Sheikh has been using these kind of images. You know, there have been other shows of this kind of displacement and movement of, of people, you know, people being displaced across um, borders, political struggles and all of that. Moving on, this is the last section and we'll wrap up in just two minutes. <clears throat> uh, this section is called World. And here we have a work by Archana Hande. I included this work by Archana Hande because I think uh, it's quite interesting uh, that she's explored this slightly lesser known history of trade between uh, the, the West side and India and Central Asia and Australia. So this was of course when India was a colony and <clears throat> Archana went to Australia for a residency and there she researched the camel ears. So there is a wild population of camels in Australia. Camels are not native to Australia. <clears throat> so where did they come from? And if you really look at the migratory histories, histories of trade, uh, basically a lot of camels were brought into Australia and the camel ears were all uh, blanketly just called Afghans because it was assumed that camels come from Af Afghanistan. But when when she went into the the sort of archives and really researched, uh, you realize that the, these Afghans were people who were term, Afga termed Afghans were people from all over, even including India, including Central Asia, including other parts uh, of Asia as well. So these were interesting. And so there's a, uh, on the left, that big uh, work that you see is a print. And the two things are on the side are from her video that she has made. And interestingly, in the quirky way that Archana Hande works, she also comments on how, now that there's this wild population of camels, and it's obviously not only camels, right? This happens all over. There are trees, there are plants, there are things that are, of course, displaced and now are thriving or in different are in different places and have become part of a of another place that they maybe didn't originate in. But uh, in Archana's quirky way, she also says how now this wild camel population, a lot of it is being packaged for meat and being sent back to the countries that it came from, well, or rather just being exported all around the world as well. So now Australia is also packaging camel meat and selling it. Uh, there's a short clip we can see, it's just 10 seconds, 15 seconds. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Yeah, we can go to the next. Uh, this is work, works by Nilima Sheik called Travel Routes on Top and Traffic on the India-China Highway. This is also the title slide that I made in the beginning of the exhibition, um, beginning of this presentation. And here you see this uh, terrain, the highlands of China, and you see different imageries of travelers across time in different books. You see a little figure of Wan Sang here, the Chinese traveler. You see others. So this, these works followed uh, Nilima's visit to China, to the Danhuang Caves, and this um, different Buddhist imagery, oriental imagery, that she sort of then really associated with and connected with and was thinking about these sort of exchanges and how a lot of oriental imagery also looks more familiar to us in some ways. And so these also relate to histories of trade with cultures and all of that. The last work um, is the, this work by Pivan Sundaram. <clears throat> it's called Eclipse. This work was made in 1991, and basically it was about uh, the Gulf War. And you can read what Vivan himself has written about this change. So like I told you, a, a lot of this exhibition is thinking about language and how language also develops. So he's spoken about this change in the 90s, how so many things were happening. Suddenly, there was foreign, you know, foreign investment was open, disinvestment open in India, foreign markets. And so there was a different connection with the world. And, <clears throat> and the, here you see what is the, uh, the one thing that you see which really screams, right? Uh, is the Garpo is this figure of Saddam uh, Hussein, right? Right in the center. And it's again a work that the more you like go close to it and see it's got very sort of overlapping intricate imagery. So there's this figure, but surrounded by like corpses, war, artillery. And this was a time where he started using the, the brown spots that you see literally took the one commodity that, you know, uh, uh, affects the whole world is what uh, the world is economically uh, dependent uh, <clears throat> on the Arab world is oil, of course. So he took this engine oil and really smeared it on the work. So that is how, uh, so I think I'm going to end here. You can read what he has written here. And we can go to the next slide, just one sec. Yeah, so this was also, I uh, just want to say that the exhibition is is also to examine figures as subject of place, right? So you have travelers, nomads, migrants, hermits, you know, those kind of things. So you see that, which I've just sort of made a little collage over here. <clears throat> also figures at war. And of course, these different terrains, different languages, different places. So I'll end there. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much, Pooja. That was that was just such an incredible walkthrough of the exhibition. Um, I personally feel like I learned so much, but also I think for those of us, uh, for those on in the audience who have taken our course, I think it would have been especially enriching. Um, so many of the ideas that you talked about, I think, are th themes that we discuss in the course as well. You know, um, place of course, but also ideas of you know national identity religion, queerness, um, looking at events like the partition and how that shaped kind of a collective experience, imagination, all of that. Um, so for those of you who haven't yet finished the course, I hope that this will be kind of encouraging to go in and, you know, learn more about some of these artists. Um, so thank you again, Pooja. Uh, I think what we can do now is that we can open up the floor for discussion and question and answers. I see that there are a, a bunch of things in the chat. Give me a second. Um, okay, maybe I can start with the first question. Um, I'm happy to read this out loud and then maybe you can respond. Um, if you could create a follow-up exhibition to Out of Place uh, where the time period extends 
uh, extend, uh, extends between the 2000s to our present, which artists would the exhibition feature in capturing similar or different themes of home and belonging? So actually there are some works that are very recent in this exhibition. Like I said, the, the work by Nilima Sheikh, Archana, even Suresh, which are from 2000s to now. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if I would do a follow-up exhibition to this, but definitely the idea is to look at different themes and connect uh, different works around different themes. Like this is the first of a series of exhibitions that we hope to uh, do with this. And you know, the, I mean, I could go into which artists, but I think there's really like, uh, there's just so many. And I really believe more than like, you know, naming artists, I really, really believe that one needs to look at specific works because I think that is the major issue that I find that happens when you even study art is this sort of sweeping generalizations on artist practices. And the one thing that, that that's something that ha, that's something that I've been working on and you see in this exhibition as well, is to really go from the general to the specific, right? So if you have, if I included just the work of Jamni Roy before, or after it's like two different works it's I'm talking about two different things right so I feel like it really is about the works it's really about the ideas in the works and um, yeah <clears throat> but the one thing that I would say is uh, the further follow-up for this exhibition one of the ideas that I was thinking I mean just as an end note that I was thinking is that it's interesting how artists themselves are in a way nomads right and now with, uh, you know, this sort of extreme sort of money, strength and uh, thing that this field has got, there are more and more residencies, there are more biennales, there are fairs, artists are constantly being these sort of global citizens. And what does that really mean? And how would that raise? So those are the interesting follow ups that were there in my mind for this, that what would that really mean for art? you know, where you are everywhere. And, and obviously it's a different sort of access. So artists themselves are also living those lives of being nomad, nomads, living in a culture, moving between different cultures and examining these from the vantage points. So that would definitely be something which would then, you know, be, yeah. <clears throat> For sure. Um, okay, <clears throat> then next question, thank you so much. Um, while talking or while thinking about place, did you also consider micro places like home as in domestic space and family space and people in relation to that? The Atul Dodia piece was an example. Yeah, so the Atul Dodia piece was an example. Also, Arpita Singh was an example. I also want to say that this is not like a, a lecture or like a book. It I'm presenting an exhibition which also has certain limitations in the in the sense of, of space. And of course I could include a lot more, but uh, it's interesting how it, it's also very specific. Like for instance, for Krishan Khanna, there was no other work from our collection that would fit into this. One may think that, you know, almost anything you could that, that way fit, but there was literally, there were very specific things that fit into this because I have chosen artists who have looked at these personal histories and personal stories and conflated it with the histor historical, with specific moments. So it is really about real happenings. And uh, that's how it sort of brings together, yeah. <clears throat> okay, um, then next question. There are a number of artworks here that deal with imaginary places or with spaces and abstraction. Um, how was the process like of selecting and connecting these works with ones that directly explore places and movement? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that again? Abstraction and? Yeah, so let me just read it again. There's a number of artworks here that deal with imaginary places or with places and abstraction. So how did you kind of select and connect these works with the ones that uh, more directly explore place and movement? Well, so the example I would give is probably the Haloi work, which was one work which was very abstract, right? Uh, <clears throat> which, as I explained, I connected to, uh, you know, again, 
um, looking at, so I've also uh, worked as an artist myself. I studied painting myself. And so these are interesting visual connections for me. And uh, which is what I try to put in the exhibition. So you do see a Gulam Sheikh, which is very specifically of Ladakh. At the same time, you have a Halloween next to it, which is not, which is untitled and is not saying what it is. But when you know the oeuvre of the artist and you know the sort of things that they have responded to, then you kind of read those things into it. So, so certain things have visual formal connections as, you know, portrayal of landscape. I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think, I think <clears throat> Um, okay, the next one. Do you think abstraction, which is also the style that modern art most notably takes, has a particular relation to works that deal with ideas of place or home? Given that displacement or placelessness, both a particular experience for some communities are also for everyone in a very globalized postmodern world, is a common experience for us today. So, A, I wouldn't say that you know, yeah, you're right. I mean, abstraction is some is um, something that was an outcome of, I mean, it wasn't seen before the modernist, Western modernism. But at the same time, that is not the only, uh, uh, the only way of working. Uh, if even if you have to read works from that period, I mean, that whole section about aesthetic teenagers uh, shows some very more narrative works, more representational works you know, more uh, those kind of works. So there was all kinds of works that was happening. What was the second part of the question? Sorry. <laughs> Let me just read it out. Given the displacement or placelessness, <clears throat> both a particular experience for some communities, but also for everyone in a very globalized postmodern world is a yeah. common experience for us today. Exactly. So actually, it's interesting that you say that because uh, um, I, I do believe that displacement is something that is a is a common experience, but of course it's varying degrees and varying sort of um, you know <clears throat> like how serious or what what causes it. Uh, interestingly, even the, the day we opened this exhibition, a lot of people came and told me how relevant it is to the times because that was the time that there was just this news that had come out about, uh, you know, the attacks in Gaza and that a hospital or a school had been attacked and people were really distraught when they came for the exhibition. But of course, uh, I do believe that I, I feel like this kind of idea, also because I'm looking at works that go back historically and now, I am connecting this, I'm trying to make a link, a common link, and I feel like, unfortunately, these are things that will always remain because, you know, we, are, we live in a world that there are very few resources and too many people, and there's always going to be conflict. So, you know, it, it, every day is insurgent. Every day we have to, like, figure what, you know, our, our focus is constantly shifting, right, from Russia war to then this to that. So I feel like it is an experience that is very uh, ill human experience of migration of displacement in however small or big way so yeah <clears throat> i think um actually the next question kind of relates to this but the next question is saying how can we see belongingness in terms of place in a pre-modern world um do we have work on pre-modern period especially in india related to this uh, it's interesting because, um, so for that, I need to an art history class. <laughs> but, um, well, yes and no, because these are things that you have to read into, right? So earlier, what were the kind of works? There were regional artworks, there was miniature painting, there was Kali Ghat painting. I mean, a lot of these also continue from Varli painting. Uh, a lot of these, we never had the idea of uh, the artist as an individual, you know, someone who authors or signs uh, names on things. Usually these were all community activities. So belonging, uh, so it's not like artists have represented belonging, but while looking at the place, uh, while looking at certain kinds of art forms, you know where they belong to. 
it's an interesting shift and also what this exhibition tries to do is to keep to try and look at this whole thing through this shift not through the idea of western modernism not through that we are derivative and this has been influenced by this and that and that and the other but also to shift and look from our own vantage points right how does it work in our context and in that time so so yeah you wouldn't find works of art that were to do with belonging but yeah you know where they belong or how they are relevant in that community so they've performed a different function some of those artworks they not only perform an aesthetic function they also have the ritualistic they also have the community function <clears throat> i think also um just back to something that you mentioned earlier in the talk um i think specifically with reference to partition you were saying how distance and time um can help us can help people speak about certain experiences um, do you think also then the distance in time changes how we look at the works of certain artists or how that changes? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That is what the exhibition is about. Also, like, for instance, like even people in my family who've actually like, you know, lived in Lahore and Lelpur and all like my grandmother, uh, she finds it very, very hard to speak about. Very hard. And it's just something that I've been thinking that, you know, one is like removed through time that now suddenly there's a partition museum. So there are people, uh, you know, in the next to next generations that are then trying to understand their, their things. So they are a bit removed from, from that incident itself. That's, that's all that I was trying to say that I feel like it's not about helping talk, but it's just the way that it is. It's too maybe close, it's too raw at that time even with Krishan Khanna like so many artworks that are now being read through partition most of these artists initially seem to be very uncomfortable about talking about it so openly right I mean that's the case with everything even in today's times you you know there are certain things that is tough for us to talk about openly yeah absolutely <clears throat> um I also Sorry, I, we're running a little bit late. It's all, it's already nine o'clock. So maybe I can read just one or two more questions um, and then <clears throat> wrap this up. Uh, so one question is that I love to see the ways uh, in which these Indian artists have put aspects of their private life and thoughts into the public, Bhupen, Zarina, and Arpana. The diversity of forms in India is amazing, but I also wonder about the ways in which the art world still privileges some voices versus others. I'm not sure whether it's art school training or the art fraternity, but, but in your opinion, how do people break into the art world if they come from self-taught or craft backgrounds? Yeah, I mean, it is a tough uh, question, but I feel like when, when you think about um, like art just post-independence, I don't think it was a field the way it is now. I don't think that there, there weren't any galleries as such. A lot of these artists sort of got together. There weren't so many people. There weren't so many artists itself, you know? So I feel like it is a growing field. And I mean, this is a, a very different kind of question because I feel like uh, there are different opportunities. In fact, I feel like the, the time that we live in today is interesting because it it does sort of, it does have the potential to really go beyond that, to tra to press to transgress the, those kind of things. You can people can self-publish. There are so many young artists coming together. It's like increasingly more and more things happening. So I feel like uh, it's a different world for many pros and cons uh, to both. And yeah, you're right. I mean. So that's what I find interesting working at the JNF because there are many artists that I didn't know about, honestly. Like I hadn't seen so many works. For instance, Pilu Pochkanwala, I hadn't seen so many works in the flesh. And it's only what you see online or something, but you, you, you won't come across so many works, right? And it's also a tricky thing, this, but anyway, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> Let's go ahead. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, okay, then the last question. Um, while planning the layout of the exhibition space and its design, 
What are some of the factors that inform these decisions? How does the space reflect the themes that the artists draw from? Um, okay, so I mean, I think I laid out some of the themes. I, I did lay out the themes, but basically I think what you're asking is about uh, like how you decide what goes where and things. So uh, for me, like I told you, for me, the consideration was that there were so many different thoughts that were coming, related thoughts. And it wasn't a, definitely not an exhibition of landscape. There were like different synergies, different registers through which, which were entry points for this. So I actually clubbed things together. I had to, for me, I work in the gallery like before the show and a lot of work happens there. I think for most curators, what you may have decided in the beginning can completely change. So for instance, that aesthetic lineages section was supposed to be much larger. And I realized that a point could be made with just those many works. I didn't need to show everything, right? Then certain architectures. And for me, like, it's interesting to see these connections between artworks, which are completely diverse otherwise. So like, for instance, Atul Lodia and, and Bahia, you know, they just sort of beautifully worked together. And if I could go back to that slide, I would also show you, like, for me, I see other things. And some of these things may not even read into the, not everyone would be, you know, looking at, at these things. But it's interesting because, like, even after uh, the that Atul Dodia painting, on the other side of the, the other partition had, uh, had Ram Kumar, which also was like a similar kind of horizon and things, you know. So, yeah, so one thing of this exhibition was I didn't want to make it rigid rooms. So they kind of flow. That's why the connection had to be made across the sections. So there was a work, these works, yeah, they connect with this idea, but also something here, which you would, you know, look at and take you to another section. So, I mean, that's the uh, simplest way I can say without getting too detailed. <clears throat> um, no, but that's that's actually really helpful. Um, I think we are running out of time. Um, so we might have to wrap things up here. Um, but thank you everyone for your questions and also for your participation. I think we had a great turnout. Yeah, thank you uh, for your patience for listening to me for so long. <laughs> no, but thank you, Pooja. It was such yeah. a wonderful exhibition. I think that all of us really enjoyed it. Um, and also thank you to Tamara from the JNAF team for yeah. helping putting this together. Thank you, Tamara, for that. <laughs> <laughs> for, you, um, for people that are in Mumbai, I hope that you'll be able to go see the exhibition while it's still on. It's up till the 19th of Feb, is that correct, Pooja? Yes, yes. Okay, so everyone, you have a month. If you're in Bombay, please go see it because I think yes, it would be mm -hmm. also an amazing experience to see it. If in I'm Mumbai. around, I'll give you a through. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think everyone I'm should puja up on that offer um but thank you everybody <clears throat> for being here um and for being a great audience and for spending your thursday night with us i really hope that you enjoyed the presentation i also hope that everyone has enjoyed our course on modern and contemporary indian art um we'd love for everyone to actually introduce themselves on our discussion forum um it's always nice for us to know who's taking our course and engaging with our work um we also have a lot more in store at the Math Academy. Um, we're excited to continue sharing all of our work with you. I think you can you know, visit our website, you can follow us on Instagram, you can subscribe to our newsletter um, to just learn about all of the work that we're doing um, with South Asian art history. Um, and do feel free to write to the email address um, that I think we'll be put in the chat box in case you have any more questions or feedback or anything like that. Um, and I think that's it, Pooja. If is there anything else you'd like to end with? No, thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you, Pooja, and thank you everybody once again. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Pooja. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.